Good afternoon, boys and girls, and welcome to episode 99 of Love at First Scent with me, Persele, is coming to you today from YouTube. I hope you're all well. It feels like it's been a little while since I've been doing this with you, but I've done this with you, although it only has been a few days. Doing the usual thing, going on the tablet to make sure that everything is coming through loud and clear, uh, so I can see comments coming up as well. Uh, send your hellos and greetings, etc. I will try to get round uh, to as many of them as possible. Um, a, a few things to say before we get started. Um, please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already done so. Uh, all of that sort of support is always very much appreciated. Uh, support uh, um, taking the form of likes and comments and thumbs up and hearts, etc., etc. Any support uh, on coffee is is always greatly appreciated as well. If you don't know what that is, then check out the. Um, uh, the, the link in the video description below. Um, and also, I should say that uh, to mark the 100th episode of Love at First Scent, on Monday we have got a very, very special interview lined up, a live interview with the current creative experience officer, or I suppose you and I would probably still call him a, a creative director, at Amouage. And that's going to be at this time on uh, Monday the 29th, it is the 29th, isn't it? Monday the 29th of June, so that's 4 p.m. UK time, which is 11 a.m. New York, uh, 7 p.m. Dubai. You don't want to miss that. I'm sure you have all got lots and lots of questions uh, that you want to ask him. And if you can't make the live broadcast, but there is a question that you would like me to put to him, please feel free to send it my way in the usual channels. You can leave uh, a question in the community tab on YouTube, or you can, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me um, on, what's the other one, on Instagram, and you can also uh, use the contact page on my blog on Um Let's just very quickly look at who's got the first comment today. It's 87 Linseed saying, how are you? It's great to catch you. I'm doing absolutely fine, thank you very much. How are you? Good afternoon, says Q George, and Kasim says, that shirt is lit. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I had, I decided I had to go for something pink, a classic gentleman's pink because of the brand that we're looking at today. Hello from Australia, says Alice. Goodness me, it's been so long since I've caught one of these live. Thanks for tuning in. Hello from Germany, says Flakaness. Hi everyone, says Angela. Fahmi says hello. Good night from Indonesia. Abdel Sarkis says hello from Puerto Rico. <laughs> we have basically covered the whole world there. And Eric says hello all from Texas. Thank you very much for tuning in. As I say, I will try and read as many of the comments as we go uh, along as possible. But we are doing another best of today, a best of brand rundown, which you will see if you took a look at the name of the video. We are looking at the best of Penhaligons, and I would like to do uh, present you today what I consider to be the top five uh, best Penhaligons perfumes, my favorite five from Penhaligons. But it, it has to be said that when I do these um, super scent episodes of when, when I was doing the, when I started doing them as written rundowns over on, on Persolase.com on the blog a few years ago, the one little rule that I always set myself was that the selection had to be made based on the perfumes that uh, are in the brand's current catalogue. In other words, um, nothing discontinued allowed. And I think with Penhaligons that, that um, raises an issue that is worth mentioning. Uh, I think we should start, as, let's smell a perfume, let's get the first one out of the way, and then probably as we go along we will talk about the business of discontinuations and, and perfumes coming and going in Penhaligons. But I would like to start with the one that is actually uh, the most modern one on the list. Now, uh, it's this one, so let me know if you if you are aware of it, if you if you like it, if you don't like it. This is Roaring Radcliffe's from Penhaligon, sorry, Ro Roaring Radcliffe from Penhaligon's, uh, part of their portraits uh, range. It may have been one of the original ones in the portrait range, I can't remember. And this one was composed by Daphne Bouget. Um, and I guess actually, as I spray this and, and smell it, that provides a good opportunity to, to talk about um, some of the issues uh, that Penhaligon's keeps keeps presenting per, us perfume lovers with. They they um, they were they were acquired by the Spanish company. A lot of you will know this, and all of the information is out there online. They were acquired by the Spanish company. Actually, I'm not going to leave that there because I want to show you this box afterwards. So I'll pop it there. Otherwise, I'll, I'll make life difficult for myself and have to keep moving everything. You can still see it there, can't you? 
This is really good, actually. This is really good. But somebody said tobacco, but a bit too warm for today, says Q. Well, I don't know where you are, Q, George, but it's pretty warm here in the, in the, in the south of Britain as well. Um, yes, it is a lovely tobacco scent. Um, oh, somebody's asked a question here that, and it's gone, why does it, okay, Arkandush is actually saying something kind of off topic. Probably you answered this one already, but I have to ask, why are you spraying the fragrance on the thinner part of the blotter instead of the bulkier one? Should we answer that one? Let's let's do a little bit of a, well, you if, if you're talking about what you are supposed to do, you are supposed to spray it on the thinner end of the blotter. It, it, it doesn't actually really matter um, because obviously it's, it's, it's the same paper. And by the way, these blotters are from the most amazing blotter making company in the south of France in grass called Sentis, Fa fascinating company. But um, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of tradition now. You know, the idea is that you're meant to be able to hold the wider end of the blotter more easily. But also, if you think about the fact that blotters are quite often dipped rather than sprayed on, you need, you need a, a, the narrower part to be able to dip into a bottle that maybe has got a smaller neck. So that's all it is. If we're being really, really purist about it, if we're being really, really proper about it, spraying on the on the broader part of the blotter is wrong. Um, but but as I say, it doesn't really, really matter. And Frederick Malblotters, of course, I mean, I haven't actually seen a Frederick Malblotter for a while, but Frederick Malblotters are just a square of card, aren't they? So you just spray the entire card and then just bring the whole thing to your nose. Anyway, the slight aside, Penhaligons and L'Artisan Parfumeur, which had been part of the same company up until 2015, were then a, a, acquired by Pooch as, as, as a unit. So Pooch currently own Penhaligons and L'Artisan Parfumeur, and they started making a few changes. Inevitably, they, they, did, they did make the Penhaligons bottles a better, weightier, more superior feeling. Of course, they did a complete rebrand with L'Artisan Parfumeur, and one of the things that they introduced over in Penhaligons, I don't really know whether the plans for this had already been in place before Pooch took over, I'd, they may well have been, was to include these portraits uh, series. You know, I, I, it, I've said it before, so I can't deny it now. I, I, I think these bottles are actually pretty ghastly. They're almost on the verge of comical. They're, 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 they're so sort of vulgar and, and wrong. I don't particularly want, you know, to have animals' heads where I st store my perfume bottles. I wonder if the idea is that they were meant to come across as eccentric. You know, all of the all of the, the perfumes in this range have been given character names, you know, so this is Roaring Radcliffe, guess what, he's a lion, do you get it? Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, there, there, there've been all sorts of other animals, I think there've been birds. Um, and the, the, the fact that they went for this design I think highlights the identity crisis that Penhaligons has experienced for quite some time because you can really, really feel in um, their range, in their releases, um, that the tension between trying to be respectful to their heritage and to their past and indeed actually keeping certain releases going like, like Blenheim Bouquet, like Hamam Bouquet, like Elizabethan Rose, like Bluebell, etc., etc., um, and trying to do something more modern, something edgier and Eccentric is hard to do. The English, again, if we're being stereotypical, especially English men, tend to do eccentric better maybe than their, than their continental counterparts. You, know, you could say that maybe Italian and French men do chic better than English men. These are really, really broad generalizations, okay? Um, the, uh, sorry, I'm just getting distracted about comments about blotters. We'll come back to the blotters thing now. Um, and as I say, Eccentric is hard to do because it can very, very, very easily tip over into, I think, just being silly and crass and a bit crude. And I don't think that they're really managing it with these bottle designs if eccentric is what they're going for. Now, having said all of that, this is where you sort of need to throw the perfume critic's words out the window. Apparently, this range has been very, very successful. So, hey, what do we know? And maybe, maybe some people like the bottles, you know, feel free to let me know if you like the bottles or not. This is the perfume that I like the most from this range. Uh, as has already been said, it's a really, really delightful, boozy and curiously powdery, soapy tobacco scent. And I think that's what I like about it. The fact that even though it's got these 
overtly masculine attributes. You know, I suppose he's meant to be some kind of a Lothario, this roaring Radcliffe persona, this chap. Um, it, 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 it softens things with this, with this inclusion of, uh, of powdery notes, powdery beeswax, um, and that makes it more interesting, more palatable. I should also say, if you're ever close to a Penhaligon's boutique, and if you've got some time, book one of their fragrance profiling sessions. I think they call it fragrance profiling now. Their, their website will tell you. Because that is how I came to uh, really learn to appreciate Roaring Radcliffe. Now, doing one of these fragrance profiling sessions with me is probably a sales assistant's worst nightmare. Um, because, because of the way my brain works, I keep trying to identify the scents, right? Now, surprise, surprise, the perfume that came out as my favourite from the fragrance po profiling, I, I knew all along was my favourite Penhaligon's perfume, so, you know, that, that didn't come as a shock. But this came a close second in the fragrance profiling process. And that was interesting because I really, really tried to put aside my prior knowledge, my prejudices, and try to open it um, with, 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 with an open mind. And tobacco is probably a bit of an easy sell for me anyway. Not that I have ever, ever smoked in my life. Um, but I do love the smell of tobacco. I love, I love the smell of pipe tobacco. And I think it's that particular smokiness that comes out in this composition. And the, the dry down is just really, really alluring somehow because of those resinous notes. So number one in the top five, Roaring Radcliffe. And we should look at some comments because there are lots coming through. Uh, where did we get to? So Q George says Milton Keynes. Okay, right. So we're not really that far away from each other, considering that we've got people from Puerto Rico and Australia here. Um, Penhaligans have beautiful bottles, says Neo Magen. If you like these as well, that's fine. Uh, Aperol Spritz says Elixir is a fantastic incense fragrance, which is but uh, sadly discontinued. Angela says it's really humid here in Leeds, but not raining yet. I think we've got the storms coming, haven't we? DB70 says, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Q George says, Penhaligans is my intro to the more niche side of the fragrance world. Ah, okay, interesting. Eric says, I'd love a top list of L'Artisan as well. Yes, I think I, I should do a top L'Artisan. That, that needs to be on its way, really. Aperol Spirit says, the new L'Artisan Parfumeur Black Bottle is a flop, in my opinion. Okay, we'll, 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 maybe we'll have time to talk about L'Artisan. Um, Lynn Smells goes back to the blotter and says the fattest end of the blotter is often printed on, which can affect the scent. Yes, and I think the fact that the printing is on there is actually indication is to sort of say, look, don't spray on this bit, hold that bit and spray on that bit. Um, uh, Lynn Smells says the bottle caps remind me of the hunting cups that were filmed in Downton Abbey before everyone rode off. <sighs> Possibly. I've never actually watched Downton. Uh, Sarah says that bottle is miserable, <laughs> but but their traditional bottles that retain the Victorian Edwardian look and feel are lovely. Yes, I, I do like that, and I love the fact that each one has got a different bow, a bow tie on or bow. Um, Aperol Spritz says you're right. The portrait series sells like hotcakes here. People buy into those obnoxious bottles. <laughs> There's not really a lot of love for the bottles here, is there? And Benjamin says, love the original bottles. I'm all for presentation, but when the cap is comically ugly, like the portraits collection, or so heavy you expect it to be a murder weapon on NCIS. <laughs> that has gone. It's funny you say that, because when these first came out, I thought to myself, oh, are they kind of doing a sort of Cluedo thing? You know, are they all these... Are you expecting, you know, like Colonel Mustard and... Um, what are they called? Miss Scarlet and, and, and Reverend Green. Now, now I feel like playing Cluedo. Um, Abdel Tarka says, I like the classics from Penhaligans. Yes, and a lot of those, of course, are gone. Denby saying hello. 87 Linseed, I have impudent cousin Matthew and love it. It's pretty common scent profile, but it is done to perfection. Now, I'm trying to remember, that's the sort of quite light citrusy one, isn't it? I seem to remember thinking that was okay. Um, okay, we, we should move on. Let's do a second one. So, for the second one, for the second one, let's actually do the one that, that is the oldest on the list. So we've gone from the newest one to the oldest one, but this is the current formulation of this one, okay? And that, that is important as well. And for the second in my top five Penhaligans, I would like to present to you uh, Lily of the Valley. Okay, Lily of the Valley is listed um, officially as having been created in 1976, but I think we can say with pretty much total certainty, you know, 99.9% .9 certainty um, that uh, it, it has been reformulated. Well, you know, I don't know why I'm not saying 100% because I can smell myself that it's been reformulated. Um, I used to consider Penhaligon's Lily of the Valley 
to be, until a few years ago, um, really and truly one of the best Lily of the Valley perfumes uh, available, ever made. I'm just trying to look here that you can see it properly. Uh, really note perfect uh, Lily of the Valley. It's credited to Michael Pickthall, uh, who, according to the internet, uh, made a few cents for Penhaligons. Funnily enough, as it happens, I was writing about Lily of the Valley uh, a little while ago for a blog post that's coming up for a review of a new perfume from um, Dolce & Gabbana, which is supposed to be a Lily of the Valley. And, and, I, and I go into this issue, um, this, the, the, the business, that it is at the moment probably actually impossible to do a really, really spot-on convincing Lily of the Valley scent because of the restrictions that have been placed on certain um, aroma chemicals that you need in order to create a lily of the valley and the fact that no perfect spot-on replacements have been provided yet. So I was very, very curious to see what the current lily of the valley smells like. It doesn't smell like, like the one that I remember, but it, it is still pretty good. And given that, you know, Durissimo can't be Durissimo, and given that Jean-Claude Elena had to try clever things when he made Muguet Porcelaine for um, for uh, Hermès, and given that people have to try all sorts of interesting tricks and to try and disguise the fact that they can't really create a fully convincing lily of the valley, this actually remains, I think, one of the best lilies of the valley on, on the market. I suppose what's happened is that it's a, now a bit less lily and a bit more soap. Um, and it's interesting trying to deconstruct what various perfumers have done in, in order to cover this sort of gaping gap in their compositions. Different people try different things. Some try to highlight the more sort of watery, aqueous notes of Lily of the Valley. Some go for lychee. Lychee seems to be a, a, a sort of common um, material that people go to. Some, some emphasize the greenness, etc., etc. This, I guess, has decided to um, go heavier on the soapy notes, on, on the musks, and maybe on the greens, but it's still great to wear. And also, I, I, I should at this point bring out this version, actually, of Penhaligon's Lily of the Valley, which, as you can see, is their soap. Now, Penhaligon's do some really, really beautiful soaps and shower gels and body lotions and things like that of, of their range. And they're the Lily of the Valley. Now, I got this Lily of the Valley soap maybe a couple of years ago now, so I suppose it's possible that, that there was a slightly older formulation. This smells gorgeous, you know, almost to the point that I, I, I don't want to use it because I want to be able to sort of store it somewhere and, and, and smell it. Um, but like, for instance, their Quercus soap. Um, Quercus isn't in my, in my top five, but if I was doing a top five Penhaligon soaps, I think I would have included it. It's a really, really gorgeous soap. So do check out their other products. Um, if, if ever um, you are looking for, you know, nice soaps and things like that. I can't find where I put my Ratcliffe blotter. Okay, there it is. Right, let's do some more comments. Uh, where are we? Eric says, I was surprised to see how inexpensive the portrait bottles looked in person. The caps are very heavy, though. I mean, the, the, there's, there's, there's some money gone into the caps, I think, I would imagine. Sarah says, does anyone remember Penhaligon's Scented Book series? That was my first intro to the brand, and the book I have is scented with Bluebell, which is still one of my favourite scents to this day. No, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And their Bluebell actually is a really good Bluebell scent, not in the top five. Abdel Sarkis, why do Penhaligon's discontinue all? Well, they certainly do discontinue a lot, and the answer to why is I don't know, except that I would imagine that some things don't sell, and they quickly discontinue them. But we may come back to that. Arkandiush says, thanks for solving the mystery of the blotters for me. Now back to the topic, I just can't stand sartorial. Oh, oh dear. But Halfetti is my favourite one. See, I, oh, I have such a problem with Halfetti. Oh, never mind. Also in my top five would be Agabati, Iris Prima, Opus 1870, and Marleybone Wood. Now, if my scan of their website is anything to go by, I think Marleybone Wood is gone. I think those three London ones that they released a few years ago are gone. Um, Angie says, sadly, I can't wear Lily of the Valley, but do love them, though. Angela says, I really don't get on with Lily of the Valley at all, and I haven't found any fragrance that I like with that accord. Well, um, <laughs> sorry, I love Lily of the Valley. Durissimo, original Durissimo is probably my favourite perfume ever. Most favourite perfume ever. Um, Eric says, I'm so wary of Lily of the Valley perfumes now, but I really, really enjoyed Muguet Porcelaine. Yes, so did I. Um, 87 linseed, is it worth the price on this Penhaligons, on these Penhaligons? Well, 
Is it worth the price? I think maybe we should just do a separate video on what we mean by is it worth the price. It's worth the price if you are happy paying whatever the price is to have that perfume. Um, Abdel Sarkis says, I love sartorial. What? I love sartorial. And then he says, Halfetti is so loud and artificial, like walking around with a drum and a drum and bass sound system on your chest or neck all day. Why don't you two just go off and decide how... I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Denby. I really, really don't like how... But I think, again, Halfetti has done very well for them. Let's move on. Let us now do... Actually, let, let's do this one because it's been mentioned a few times. I've got a, I've got a dinky little sample of this one. This is Bertrand Duchaufour's Sartorial from 2010. This came in this, which is why I wanted to be able to open this and show you. It was a, it was a set that I got of five of their men's perfumes. Can you see that there? Really, really cute little set. But I think even from this set, which I've only had for a few years, I think one of these has already been discontinued. What was it called? Beoli or Beolia? Um, the, my Juniper Sling is taken from there. Now, Juniper Sling is one that I don't personally wear. I'm not even sure that I would say that I personally love it. But when trying to come up with this top five, I had to, I had to include it because I, I do think it's interesting. See, we're going to struggle now. I do think it's interesting. Um, and again, given that it's not easy to do uh, modern fougere, is this going to work or maybe I, maybe I just need to go on skin with this. Let's do skin. Let's do sartorial skin. Yeah, there we go. I'm not going to put any other ones on skin now. Um, given that it's very, very difficult to do uh, fougere without making it smell crude nowadays, um, probably because of the fact that you can't use as much bergamot as you might want to, or a certain sort of bergamot, or as much oak moss. This was this was at least interesting, and I, and I think it remains one of the most interesting perfumes in the Penhaligon's collection, which is why I thought, okay, let's stick it in there. For those of you who aren't aware, um, Bertrand Duchaufour went to the, the Savile Row tailors, the men's outfitters called Norton and Son, and he decided that he wanted to try and um, capture the smell, uh, the atmosphere he felt there. And the, 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 there was a lot of ironing going on. And if, you, and if you've ever done any ironing, then you will know that there is something very, very particular about the smell of the, the hot steam from the iron reacting with the metal, the metal, the hot plate of the iron. It, it does seem to produce a very, very distinctive odour of its own. And Duchaufour tried to capture that in Sartorial, and also I guess it made sense in terms of perfume structure that for something that was going to be called Sartorial, that was inspired by classic uh, English men's tailoring, that he would go for the fougere structure, you know, this most stereotypically classically masculine of perfume structures. And all of those ideas are very much in evidence here. You know, he, he has done it. It works. You really, really get that steamy metallic note. And on some people, it works beautifully. I'm not a huge uh, subscriber to this idea that smells, that perfumes smell very, very different on different people. I agree that they smell subtly different on different people, slightly different on different people. But it's those subtle variations that, can, that really make um, sartorial sing on some people's skins. Where I where I lose interest in it, I guess, is that where it starts developing, it goes down uh, more predictable, more more um, obvious current fougere territory, where the the woods start becoming a, maybe a little bit crude, the mosses start becoming a little bit coarse. And, you know, when you think about the fact that um, Jiki is, is, is the sort of one of the, 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 the peaks of Fougere um, achievement. Uh, there you go, somebody's just said Jiki. Um, when, when I've had the, the tremendous, tremendous honour and privilege and pleasure of smelling the original formulation of Fougere Royale uh, at the Osmotech in Versailles, and, and when I was just so bowled over the, by the fact that it just smelt so gentle, you know, there's so many modern fougères are actually rough and coarse and have have a kind of barber shop crudeness to them, whereas fougère royale, the original, is is just so tender. It's a really really tender expression of masculinity. 
Jiki does that sort of thing as well. And again, if I'm thinking of, an, of a supremely successful modern fougère, the first one that comes to mind is Geranium pour Monsieur from Frédéric Mal, composed by Dominique Ropion. They, they convey that outdoorsiness, that freshness, that delicacy so well, whereas for so many uh, brands, fougère seems to have to mean roughness. And, 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 and sartorial does start heading in that direction for me a little bit, which is why, you know, if I had to put this top five in order, um, sartorial would be, would be at the bottom of, of the top five. But it is still in top five, okay, because I don't want to detract from what I said about the fact that it is a very, very interesting scent, and at least Duchaufour has wor worked hard to bring a genuinely novel twist to the fougère structure. Okay, more comments. Uh, where did we get to? Um, Andy says, I am awaiting a delivery of Opus 1870 today. How funny. Yuzu cedar and incense, rather good, especially in the sale. Yes, actually, for those watching now, Penhaligans and Lattizan have got their summer sale on. I'm not on commission. If you're watching after this sale, then sorry, wait till next year. Um, Eric says, I had a guest who wore Castile and she smelled lovely. She seemed, she seemed so, hang on, she seemed so stern to smell like soap, though. Oh, you mean two? Okay, right. DB70, speaking of Bertrand Duchaufour's sartorial, what are your thoughts on that one, Mr. P? Ta da! <laughs> How's that? Um, Angela says, gorgeous set. Yes, that is a pretty set. Notes of scent. Luna is in my top top one. What do you think of Endymion? Oh, see, lots of people love Endymion, don't they? For some for some people, Endymion is almost like catnip, isn't it? I, 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 I struggle with Endymion. Never mind. April Spritz says, my top three Penhaligans, sartorial, Blenheim Bouquet, and Ostara. Uh, notes of scent, Juniper Sling is gin tonic-ish. Yes, absolutely, it's meant to be. Uh, Abdel Saki says, I wear sartorial a lot. The perfect fougère. Ooh, okay. Praise indeed. Love the honey in this scent and the metallic note. We've talked about Jiki. Do you get honey in sartorial, says Abdel Saki. Do I get honey? Now that you say it, maybe, again, maybe that kind of beeswax feel of, of Roaring Radcliffe, but it's not something I would have thought of. Uh, Mirel says hello from Bucharest. Uh, Angela concurs that Jiki is divine. Eric says, not sure if I've smelled sartorial. You should check it out. You really should check it out. A lovely explanation, says Lynn Smells. Oh, you're, um, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm, which one? The Fougere one, I suppose. Arkandius says, you managed to convince me, so Halfetti is out from number one. Oh no, that's not what this is about. And his place will be taken by Marley Bonewood instead. <laughs> Vitali says, is the steamy note in sartorial close to that in Outrageous? Hmm, no, I think, in a word. Thank you for your good content, says Ali Jafari. You're more than welcome. Thank you for watching. Nubianet says, I'm wearing Vara today. I like it. I like Vara too. Denvi says, I like sartorial. It smells very reminiscent of Brute. Yeah, but that's not good. <laughs> okay. I wonder if Duchaufour used Brute as the core and accented it with the beeswax metallic elements or if the similarity is just coincidental. It's not coincidental because Brute is, is a fougère as well or was a fougère at some stage in its existence. And 87, Lindsay, do you smell a lot of naturals or chemicals in these Penhaligans? Ugh, that, well, let's not go there. Penhaligans, I think, would do better to include a few more naturals in their compositions. And Eric says, I have some 40s Fougère Royale Extrait, and it is very smooth and tender. <gasps> Treasure that. I was really surprised to see how that lineage travelled. Okay, before we do the final two, I do want to spare just a few minutes for the discontinued gems from Penhaligans. We've talked about this a lot already. Penhaligans has got way more than its fair share of discontinued scents. And certainly, round about the sort of 2008, 2009, 10, up to sort of 2012, 13, 14, they were releasing so many interesting things. They worked a lot with Bertrand Duchaufour. Um, oh, great. The, the, the lady's name who was in charge there has now... Sarah Rotherham, Phew, thank you very much, who is now, who's now got a position, high up position at Miller Harris. She came along and, and, and shook things up, uh, brought in a really, really vibrant, exciting, dynamic team who had all sorts of wonderful ideas, you know, the fact that they used uh, uh, Duchaufour and they created really wonderful work, you know, work that, that deserved to stick around. And so, for instance, here I've got my bottle of Amaranthine from 2009, Peonive, and this is actually 
this is the this is the extrait of peony that i managed to get this is the perf i have also got in my collection the extrait of amaranthine which is which is just beyond heavenly um they made a really beautiful bottle for it but uh, but uh, but i don't have that bottle i've just sort of got a refill like this and there you've got ostara which was also made by uh, bertrand du chauffour and that let me just look was it 2015 the, the the scents didn't do well they were discontinued quite quickly who knows why they didn't do well you know you you could have all sorts of theories as to as to why they weren't successful they may actually have been a little bit too interesting a little bit too edgy a little bit too independent minded in terms of their competition in terms of their composition rather for Penhaligons, you know, you could say that actually maybe Amaranthine should have been a L'Artisan scent, that Ostara should have been a L'Artisan scent, perhaps Peonive as well. Um, somebody, somebody's saying the reason why Ostara was discontinued is still a conspiracy theory. Well, if it is, I don't know what it is, but feel free to share. But, you know, Amaranthine, I, I, I want to smell Amaranthine again. It was, apparently the brief for this was that it was supposed to be the smell of the, of the inside of a woman's thigh. Now, whether or not it really does smell like the inside of a woman's thigh is almost a sort of moot point, but I suppose the concept behind that, the thinking behind that, is that it meant to, it's meant to be super intimate, super creamy, milky, sensuous. And Duchamp interpreted this as, as white on white on white. So he, he thought of all of the sort of white notes that he could find and laid them on top of each other so that you've got things like milky notes, steamed milk notes, condensed milk notes, you've got um, a, a kind of banana note, ylang ylang banana, which has a white feel to it. You've got, you've got, uh, and of course ylang ylang is, is a white floral, so all of that conceptually, it just works so well. And I still think the closest newish release that I can think of um, that, that kind of continues um, uh, Amaranthine's lineage is, is Apsu. From, from Ulrich Lang, even though that is quite a different scent, you know, it goes, that one goes into a much more aqueous green um, direction. Um, but it's just, it's just gorgeous and, and they didn't do well. I have this personal idea and if anybody, you know, has got any experience of working in marketing or knows anything about the brand, you know, feel free to agree or disagree because I'd really love to know what you think. I also have this personal notion that the names of these scents were really not fantastically thought out. Again, just as just as it's hard to to do eccentric well, you know, it's very very easy to tip over into silliness. When you come up with a perfume name and you want it to be different and you want it to come up high in search results and you want it to be original, it's it's very easy to tip over into weird. And you know, particularly for example, in a name like Ostara, you know, I think we've got at least one Polish speaker here, Ostara. Is, is not the best name for a perfume for the Polish market. I mean, okay, the Polish market is not maybe perhaps the largest market in, in the world, but, but even in English, you know, Ostara, I, I, that, that doesn't sound like the sort of, what does it mean in Polish? Um, Dream of Me No More says, it's, it's kind of, you might be, it, it's kind of like saying, oh, old one, but it's the feminine form of old one. So it's almost like you're saying, oh, you old biddy, oh, oh old biddy, old granny kind of thing. Um, yeah, is that right, Arkadiusz? Is, is somebody who speaks Polish still watching? They can old lady perf. Yes, you know, if you were in Poland and you sort of said, "What are you? What are you wearing?" And some, they said, "Oh, I'm wearing Ostara." They'd go, oh, "Okay, <laughs> you're a bit young for that." Um, you know, Amaranthine, not the easiest name to remember. And Peonive. Okay, at least Peonive is is um, is referring to the fact that it's that's a peony. But you know, look look at the ones that have done well. Sartorial. Genius name, Juniper Sling, genius name. At least Roaring Radcliffe goes with the idea of the portraits and is a name that you remember. Vara, you know, you, you could say, okay, Vara is an interesting one because that's an unusual name for the, for the English-speaking world, world, but very, very easy to remember and has got a kind of romantic feel to it, I suppose, goes with the idea of uh, 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 a Rajasthani princess. So, I don't know, perfume names are very, very important I'm not saying that if you come up with, with a good name, that's all you need, but certainly if you've got a dodgy name, um, then I, and I think you're going to have a bit of a struggle on your hands. Um, you know, I, I, think of, I think of when Andy Tower, at least it was a limited edition, Andy Tower released uh, a scent many years ago now called Dark Passage. And you just think, oh dear. Um, and that, that, was, that was meant to have been inspired by film noir. So you, you, you do sort of think, okay, I, I know what you're, where you're going, but 
maybe not the best <laughs> perfume name you could have chosen. Um, so yes, just just a few minutes to, to to mention the discontinued ones. If you ever if you ever find them anywhere, that they really really are worth checking out. And and there are lots of discontinued ones in the Penhaligon's um, catalog. Okay, uh, some more comments before we do the last two. Uh, Angela says uh, Vara is my only Penhaligon's at the moment. Dream of Me No More says Ooh la la the shirt reminds me of fruit salads and the seventies. Hello from London. I am late. No, I actually like this shirt. It's fine. Um, don't like Brute Blasphemy, says Denby. <laughs> um, Angela says Brute could remove a layer of skin. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. 87 Linseed. I smelt Brute for the first time a month ago and it reminded me a lot of Roger Dove's Danger. Ooh, let's just not go there now. Um, Dream of Me No More. What, what J.K. Rowling would understand as a woman or that of an intersectional feminist. Oh my goodness, no, please let's not bring J.K. Rowling into this now. Uh, Eric is showing a lot of love for Ostara. Uh, Eric again says, I think uh, Denise Beaulieu from Grand de Musk said, a natural in Ostara became unavailable either by cost or quality. Okay, now that is possible. That's possible because certainly Ostara became discontinued very, very quickly. And that is very, very possible. It could have been an issue like that. I like Empressa, says Flacones, but I think it's not that popular. Arkadiusz, note for future, a review of the Italian house, Acqua di Portofino. I don't know them. They're very affordable, eight fragrances in the line, and I would put them somewhere between designer and niche. I will have to check them out. Thank you very much. Dream of Me No More says, do you remember the woman on Dragon's Den? Well, stop, I hardly ever watch TV, so no, I've never seen Dragon's Den, with an anti-freeze product for women called, <laughs> called she Icer. Not, not, not one for the German market. Ah, so there you go, she Icer. It's like, what, what car is it? Is it the, is it, the, the Vauxhall? Is it, is, is, or is it, which, which, which car brand makes the Nova? Um, in Spain, they really struggled with that because it's Nova, you know, as in like it, it doesn't go. Um, love your smile, says Lynn. That's very nice. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm really, really smiling a lot today. I don't want to smell like a dark passage, says DP17. No, <laughs> please, we need to move on. Dark passage is no longer available. Well, the perfume is no longer available. Other dark passages may be available. We so need to move on from this topic. Um, Joao says, hello, Mr. P. Sorry I'm late. Yes, go and sit in the corner right now for being late. How dare you? Where's your note? Aperol Spritz. A quick Google search shows me that Ostara is the name of a Germanic goddess. Yes, of, from whom Easter is named. Yes, that was the idea. But, you know, do you really want to start explaining all of that when you, when you talk about the name of the perfume you're wearing? Arkandiusz says, my Polish is rusty, but I heard a Polish guy yesterday in a store, but he could be Hungarian. I'm in Serbia. Oh, sorry. Okay. I just totally assumed because of your name that you're Polish, but we do have somebody who's just tuned in from Katowice. Um, Abdel Sarkis says, what do you think about the work that Olivier Cresp has done for Penhaligans? Well, um, I, I did like Peonive. 87 Linseed, as a house with heritage, do you prefer Penhaligans or Garlin? Ooh, sorry for me, no contest. It would, would, it would have to be Garlin. I think Penhaligans have done a little bit too much messing around. Tomas, I don't know whether you picked up on the fact that we were laughing about the fact that in, 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 in um, Poland, the name Ostara wouldn't have been fantastic for a perfume. But Tomas is saying, hello from Katowice. I'm a bit late today. The only Penhaligans I own is a metallic lavender beard oil. And I'm not particularly fond of, fine. Let me say it is quite passable sometimes. Um, glad to catch you live, says Davlone, Hamam Bouquet and Castile for me. Okay, we need to do the last two very, very quickly. And let's save my very favorite one for last. Let's do this one. It's been mentioned quite a bit. This is from 2013. Now this is great. Uh, a Bertrand du Chauffour composition, Vara. Penhaligans is as authentic as a National Trust gift shop. <sighs> Oof. Ooh, the critics are out in full force today. Um, this uh, famously was a scent that was originally going to be for a Rajasthani princess. Literally, I'm not making that up. You know, the, a princess in Jodhpur, or J Jodhpur, I think I'm supposed to pronounce it. Um, if you ever, ever, ever get a chance to go to uh, Jodhpur, make sure you visit the, the, the palace. Well, actually, make sure you go to Rajasthan. It is so beautiful. Um, this is, this is a really, really fantastic um, fruity, as in quince-like rose. This is Duchaufour probably pushing his most, his niche sensibilities, his independent sensibilities, further than he has done in a mainstreamish sort of brand. Because, you know, I don't really consider Penhaligans to be that 
much of a niche brand. Can I? I don't know which way to move this now. Do I need to turn it here? Um, really, really fantastic. Really, it it's interesting because it it's got a regal quality to it, but I think he very much took his cue from the fact that this was for a princess as opposed to a queen. So it's youthful. Um, one of my nieces. Some of you, some of you have met her you know when i was testing when i was testing the live interview system here on youtube she was the one that i used as my guinea pig and vara is her favorite perfume and i keep moving this the wrong way vara is her per favorite perfume and it and it absolutely suits her because well because she's she's still young um i remember your niece says dream of me no more did you give her a moho sample well let's let's just move on we don't need to talk about that one um and but but she's she's bubbly the clothes that she wears are always colorful she's always messing around with her hair colors she's always got some sort of a craft project uh, happening in her house you know d she's putting up different colored paintings and buying different colored rugs and um buying clothes and sort of um uh, personalizing them accessorizing them etc etc and it's that sort of um bubbly, effervescent young personality um, that I think is, is, is really, really fantastically captured in Vara. So a real triumph, and of course it wouldn't be a Duchoffel composition without a sort of, without that incense note going through there, maybe some sort of Divana wood. Um, it works so well, and my niece reliably informs me that the candle works very, very well too. And before we do the last one, let's just quickly look at the comments. Uh, Tomasz agrees, Ostara in Polish could be translated into English as follows. There you go. Oh, poor old hag or something. Sorry to say that. No, no, that, that, that's exactly what we were talking about. Uh, Cousin says, what a coincidence. I'm wearing Endymion today. Um, Davlon says, interesting that you actually get the quince. The few times I've tried it, I've got a blurred, vague, fruity rose. My loss, I guess. But sort of blurred rose. I mean, because quince is, 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 is a sort of jammy, jamminess anyway. Um... Uh, where did we get to? The Burrow Nerdy Fragrance Review says, I feel like Duchaufour has become my most favourite perfumer. I need to dive further into his compositions. I mean, he is certainly one of the most skilled perfumers working today, one of the most talented. Um, he's he's got to be, I think, in the top five perfumers working at the moment. Arkadiusz says, to be fair, I borrowed a Polish first name and Danish last name. My real name is Dragisa. Do you say Dragisa or Dragisha? And if it's easier to pronounce, my nickname is Gile, Gil? See, I'm going to go with Arkadiusz, because at least I know how to say that. Uh, Isaac says, hello from Hong Kong. A bit late to join today, doesn't matter. Nubianet, Vara is nice if you prefer spicier scents, but you want something fresher. In the sense that, yes, it kind of brings a youthful freshness to it. Quince Rose sounds like a mod of Gallo, says Eric, uh, but no leather, okay? So Gallo has got that beautiful, strong uh, suede note. My favourite Penhaligans is the Duke, says Isaac. A uh, national claims expert says Cairo is amazing. Yeah, I see again. I, I wasn't crazy about Cairo. Nancy says Aloha from a new listener. Hello. Um, turned on to fragrance during quarantine, learning and loving all the residents to culture and the arts, and of course being transported while staying in place. Salams. Thank you very much for watching and tuning in. Arkadiusz says Ostara in Polish, in Polish is in Serbian is Stara. There you go then. And Kozin says, I must try Castile and Orange Blossom, though they've been on my to-try list forever. And Berto is saying a late hello and dream of me no more. Penhaligans is such a wonderful Cornish name. I wonder why they never push the Cornish aspect. Maybe we should ask them. Maybe we should all have a pasty right now. Um, and a comment there. Oh, my God, you said it right. Both my name and my nickname and the second try. Yeah, but now I don't remember what I said. Last one. Last one in the top five Penhaligans perfumes. And we've just mentioned it now. My favorite is Orange Blossom. This is the uh, the Duchaufour reformulation because the original Orange Blossom came out in 1976. And then in 2010, Duchaufour was tasked with updating some of them. This is just wonderful. And you know the fragrance profiling session that I mentioned to you a little while ago? This came out as my favorite, but I kind of always knew it would. And as I was, um, as, the, as the perfumes were given to me, being given to me blind, um, I recognize this one straight away because I, I, I know it, I, I love it. Um, and it is, uh, even though I don't like to divide my perfumes according to times of year, I think I was partially inspired to do this video today because we have had uh, some hot days here, in, in at least in the south of England, 
and I tend to somehow instinctively reach for Penhaligon's Orange Blossom when it's a hot day and also things like, uh, you know, Garland's Herba Fresco or Garland's Pompe Lune. This is just, it, it's so, it, it's so good. But, but, it's, but it's not a straightforward Orange Blossom soliflor, okay? If you, if you want Orange Blossom, just Orange Blossom on its own, you'd probably be better off going to Duchaufour uh, Seville, you know, Seville à l'aube uh, scent for L'Artisan Parfumeur or his Histoire d'Oranger for L'Artisan Parfumeur. No, maybe not his, but Histoire d'Oranger for L'Artisan Parfumeur. I forget who made it. That may not have been Du Chauffour. This is, this is Orange Blossom as a kind of whole plant experience. So I think here you, you, you do get, obviously, the Orange Blossom, but, but you also think of the tree and you think of the orange blossom in context and you may even have some trees next to it that have already got some orange fruit hanging off them. And you very, very much think here, I think, when you're wearing this perfume of nature in action. I wrote about it in my book and I said that it's a perfume that is very well versed about the birds and the bees because there's a lot going on in this perfume, you know, that the bees are going to the blossoms and the flowers and doing, and doing their thing, and there may be, you know, a young couple beneath the tree in the shade of the tree doing their thing, and, and nature is just bursting and doing its thing in this perfume. It's a very, but, but it's a very, very innocently sensuous perfume, okay? There's nothing, there's nothing overtly carnal about it, and yet it is aware of carnality, it is aware of sensuality. Um, perhaps a fruity note again at the top, uh, a, a green note, um, and and of course that 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 incense um, signature that seems to run through so many of Duchaufour scents. Really, really love Orange Blossom, and I'm so pleased that it's still part of the Penhaligon's um, the Penhaligon's catalogue. And I will be very, very sad if the day ever comes that they get rid of it. I would definitely stock up. See, it's almost like sort of got a burnt candle feel to it sometimes. Really great stuff. Okay, final go through the comments then. Uh, where did we go to? Cousin says, well, 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 there you go, see. Um, how about a narrowly orange blossom list? Yeah, very good idea, should do that one day. Love orange blossom, says Angela. And Angie Cox says, very fond of Malabar, but always love Hamam Bouquet. Uh, Adel Sarki says, orange blossom is lovely. Davlone, does orange blossom have the heft of something like Lutens' Fleur d'Oranger? Well, Fleur d'Oranger is, is, is quite strong on the cumin, isn't it? So no, it's not heavy uh, like the, the Lutans. The Lutans is, is much more opulent, much darker somehow, isn't it? Seville Lobe is a Duchaufour, says Tina. Just bought it today. Yes, that one is, but I'm not sure if Histoire d'Oranger is a Duchaufour. Abdel Sarkis, what's the name of your book? Show it on camera. Do you know what? I think if I try to move the stuff there, it would all fall apart. Go to persalaise.com and you will find out more about my book, although sadly it is out of print. Uh, Tomash says, oh great, I feel that I'm just starting to get myself slightly more interested in Pell Halligans due to this orange blossom scent you're talking about now. It's, I, I really love it. You should check it out. Arkadiusz, when is the next live? Good question. Next episode of Love at First Scent, the 100th episode, will be on Monday, this Monday, the 29th of June, 4 p.m. UK time, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. New York, 7 p.m. Dubai, and that will be a live interview with the current new creative director, creative experience officer at Amouage. So don't miss that. That is probably perfect note on which to say goodbye. But I'm just going to do the few more comments very quickly. Duchaufour is an amazing perfumer, says Denby, but after smelling a good proportion of his work, I feel like he has a tendency to phone it in unless he's given strong artistic creative direction. And I'll complete your sentence for you by people like Nila Vermeer. I think in recent years, the best work he has done has been for Nila Vermeer. Does Hamam Bouquet smell dated? Oh, we don't have time to talk about it today, maybe another time. Uh, examples, Vermeer, Eau d'Italien, L'Artisan, says Denby, yeah. Diane says, how does this compare to Zara and Joe Malone orange blossom? Oh, um, this is vastly, vastly superior in, in, in a sentence. Umberto says, Lutans is dark, I love that. Uh, and dream of me no more, finally. Duchaufour makes interesting perfumes which are to appeal to perfumistas who want to identify notes, in my opinion. Yeah, possibly, and Thank you so much, says DB70, and I say thank you very much as well. I've really, really enjoyed today's episode. I ha hope you have too. If you can't tune in live on the Monday for the Amouage interview, send me some questions because I'm sure you have got lots. Until then, stay safe, be good, take care, bye.